It is great to see so many delegates here. There's been a very tumultuous time in the dairy industry, especially over the last 12 months being extremely tough. Our production across the country has fallen over the last number of years and especially this year. It's important that we're all working together as an industry to ensure that the industry is prosperous into the future. This symposium would not be possible without our sponsors for this event. I would especially like to thank the Sydney University for their support for the Foundation. I'd also like to thank our platinum sponsor, Dairy Australia, who has been a long time supporter of this event. Bega for supporting the Emerging Scientist Program. Our gold sponsors, Dairy New South Wales and Local Land Services. The silver sponsors, Dairy New South Wales, Laley and Westpac. And our bronze sponsors, Jeffo, New South Wales Farmers, Cybers, ABV Vista, Lactalis and Pasture.io. I'd also like to thank Dairy Connect who are sponsoring the Dairy Science Award that will be presented tonight. There are representatives here from our sponsors today and tomorrow, so I'd encourage that you all meet with those through the break sessions. This event has been coordinated with the help of the DRF Director, Professor Yanni Garcia, together with the organising committee who have put together this great program. I'd like to thank them for all their great efforts. This symposium is about bringing research and information from our industry peers and other bodies. We are going to hear about feed base today and it is very important under the current <coughs> feed situation that many farmers are facing. With feed costs at record highs and rainfall in many regions along the eastern seaboard at historically low, it is very important that we are aware of some of the information that is available to us. We will also have nine emerging scientists presenting tomorrow. This is a very important part of our symposium and I encourage everyone to use the cards handed out to help score each of the presenters. This helps them develop their skills and knowledge and the feedback is very well received. I'd, I'd like to officially open the symposium and thank everyone for their attendance and support and now I'd like to invite Jeff Odgers, Chair of Dairy Australia. Good afternoon everyone and thanks Michael. Um, I, uh, I hail from Shepparton in Victoria where the family and I milk around 750 cows and uh, recently uh, Michael Parrish has really become a neighbour and uh, I know Michael's a proud New South Wales citizen and uh, I guess with his move to a, to a farming operation at Shepparton and some of the, uh, the dynamics in the milk market, market at the moment, Sean, we're wondering whether the New South Wales border has actually gone south as well. But uh, look, um, welcome and uh, DA is delighted to continue our association uh, as the platinum sponsor of this event. And it really is great to be amongst the New South Wales industry. I do travel to Bega uh, for Bega Chiefs board meetings uh, periodically, so I understand you've all made um, an effort to get here. It is a little bit out of the way, but as the Mayor said this morning, uh, it's a beautiful spot and a great place to spend a couple of days. And I know that farmers and all of you from the broader industry who are also critically important really love to gather at these types of events, and, and I always reckon that it's these sorts of events where you genuinely you find the spirit of industry that we all love being part of. It's where we talk about um, the things that matter most to us, and, and, and there's a lot of those at the moment. I also want to thank the University of Sydney and uh, the chair of the organising committee, Yanni Garcia, uh, for pulling together today's excellent program and really apt that we're focused on homegrown feed and, and feed base. This event always brings a significant element of science. And again, this year, international perspectives from Dr. David Chapman and Dr. Edwin Crikey's. So welcome, gentlemen. And tonight, we'll be introduced and meet the emerging young scientists. So I'm really looking forward to that. Research and science and how we get that onto farms is very much a focus of what we do at Dairy Australia. Uh, dairy Bio and, and Dairy Food Base are, are major national programs at the moment. Dairy Bio is a five-year program 
which is essentially designed to deliver step change in animal and plant breeding through genomic selection and, and hybrid breeding. It's exciting and in the early 2020s we'll be seeing that on farm. Dairy feed base to some extent is built off that research in dairy bio and in simplistic terms brings ag tech to play in terms of how we manage uh, all sorts of things at paddock level, how we manage animal nutrition and how we contain costs. And, and I think um, we're about uh, 18 months into that and, and that also I think um, very important and will deliver a lot. And in terms of leverage on farmer levies, both of those programs are about five to one and leverage is always important. And the Australian dairy must continue to invest in science and innovation. We all know that, but it does require ongoing commitment and effort to do it. It does set us up for success in better times and it helps us to get through tough periods. And there's no doubt we've endured a succession of very tough years, particularly so in New South Wales. And the imp impacts of that on the broader dairy farming community have been profound. From market and supply chain pressures through to the attraction and retention of people in the industry and of course the impact on farm profitability and finances. And this, this situation was a large part of the reason behind the launch of Australian Dairy Plan last November. After years of real pressure, this industry has to find a way back to being more profitable, which brings more confidence and being more united. And, and I've been delighted to hear a lot of talk this morning about we do need to be united. We realise that we're in a sufficiently difficult enough place as an industry that, that is, that's critically important. And um, that, that, that's being had across the country. At the outset of the dairy plan uh, rollout, the partner, the partner organisations in, in Dairy Australia, Australian Dairy Farmers, Australian Dairy Products Federation and Gardener Foundation put together a situation analysis paper to try and define our current situation as, as dairy nationally. Uh, to some extent, a, a state, of, state of the industry report, which essentially says that in terms of global competition and relevance, um, markets um, have evolved faster than the, than the rest of this industry in Australia. It says that on-farm profitability has become more difficult as well as volatile, and that's in most regions. And that is down to complexity, uh, it's down to volatility in markets and climate. This, this, this country, and I, and I think we acknowledge it now, but we all know that Australia is a dry continent. Um, we all know and, and feel that there's something happening with climate, that we're having a degree of climate change. We're also the most variable climate on the planet by a significant amount. And when you put all those things together, it makes it pretty challenging to farm given some of the shifts in, in market and seasons that we're now seeing. And I'm, I guess I'm fortunate, um, I, I travel to many parts of Australia and I talk to farmers just like you in many communities and their seasons are changing significantly. And that's really playing to the way that we're running farm systems and whether we can, whether we can actually make a return. And so we've, we as people in dairy and as dairy organisations, we have to continue to adapt. We have to try and get in front of that if we're going to succeed. The skill base, and it was said earlier on stage, the skill base of being a dairy farmer in this country just keeps getting broader. And so that's what we're dealing with. And that's been reflected uh, in the workshops that we've held around the country. So we've had 24 dairy workshops in all of the dairy regions. I've got to say the engagement from farmers has been excellent. I've been delighted. Uh, we've had around a thousand people turn up to those workshops. It's been democratic and people have genuinely had the opportunity 
to put on the table what they're feeling and what's on their minds. And the themes really, no matter which region, have been pretty consistent. Farmers are looking for leadership. Farmers want a voice. Farmers want to speak to consumers and government alike about the value of dairy, about the value of people in dairy, and about the enormous value that resides in, in the regional dairy communities. They also want to talk about attracting people to the industry, um, how we support the next generation entering. And there's been recognition that we must continue to make gains on farm as we respond to the increased complexity of doing business. So the challenge now is to take all of these significant contributions and to begin to build a plan. And to that effect, um, there'll be a national workshop held in Melbourne at the end of July, where we'll bring together about 150 industry people. Of course, there'll be people there that are in organisational roles, but we're trying to keep um, the people that attend that event as diverse as possible and really get a good sense of what people want to do going forward in setting future priorities and actions that, that we will build on the back of what we've learned in those regional workshops. So look, I just, I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk about Australian Dairy Plan. I think, uh, given all the talk about being united, given the acknowledgement of the significant challenges we face, this is a really critical time. And I think Australian Dairy Plan will work with all of industry to find the answers we all need. I hope you enjoy this symposium. I look forward to catching up um, with as many of you as possible um, one on one, so thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that. I'd like to now call up Cameron Clark, who will facilitate the next session. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here in Bega. And could I first of all just congratulate uh, the local bigger community uh, for helping put this on and also to uh, Professor Garcia also uh, for coordinating the whole committee and keeping us all on track. Um, it's quite an effort and also to Tara as well uh, for keeping us all on the straight and level and keeping us to time and I will do my best as chair of this opening session uh, to do that. Uh, but it's my absolute honour in the, uh, around the focus of this uh, symposium today about feed base and homegrown feed as the basis of profitable dairy systems in any type of production system, uh, to welcome David Chapman uh, up to the stage here as your keynote uh, for this presentation. I've known David for quite a while, and David is a true world expert in feed-based feed research, pasture production and utilisation, in terms of grazing management, nutrient utilisation, and the application of science into farm practice. Decades of research both in New Zealand and Australia have been backed up by hundreds of manuscripts. With many successful industry-driven programs, David really does bring to our symposium a unique range of expertise and the latest on research-driven innovation in pasture-based systems. As currently principal scientist in Dairy NZ in the Farm Systems Research Group, and with several decades of pastoral science at the University of Melbourne, David is now leading large research programs that are addressing the big challenges that shape the future of pasture-based livestock production in New Zealand. I welcome David to the lectern to talk to us about dairy feed base in the future environment. How is New Zealand research responding to these challenges? Please join me in welcoming David to the stage. Uh, thank you very much, Cameron. And, um, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank Yanni and the uh, organising committee in particular for the invitation to, to address the uh, symposium today. Um, it may seem a bit strange having a Kiwi up here talking about our industry in a conference that's focused on your industry issues, but as we know, there's a lot in common between our two industries. Uh, feed base is probably our single biggest common feature. Um, and so the feature, oh, so the um, the focus on feedback, uh, feed base for this symposium is uh, is a very good basis for um, further discussion and about the the issues 
um, addressing uh, both of our industries, of, or confronting both of our industries. So I just thought um, very briefly a little bit about Dairy NZ before I start, just so that you understand some of the context of what I'm going to talk about here. Dairy NZ is, is very similar to Dairy Australia, um, has similar roles, collects the levy and allocates the levy to R&D programs. But one of the differences is Dairy NZ does retain a, a small research team. There's about 20 of us in the research team. It also retains a consulting officer service, which is like our extension arm. Um, so it has a more of an operational role, uh, and that's been a strategic decision on behalf of the industry over many years to maintain that capability. And also what Dairy NZ is responsible for doing is developing an industry strategy. And this is done in collaboration with the milk companies and other stakeholders in the industry, and so it's a whole of industry strategy. It's often referred to as the Dairy NZ strategy, but it's not, it's actually the whole industry strategy. Um, this is refreshed every five years, and it has a number of commitments in it. And these are framed as commitments. These are statements about what the industry collectively will do, um, not only to maintain its competitive and resilient basis, but also to benefit communities, uh, environment, and New Zealand as a whole. So um, when we have uh, the subtitle here is how is New Zealand research responding to the challenge? The research is very much directed by that strategy. Anything that is that is proposed for levy funding has to be able to demonstrate how it's contributing to that longer term strategy. Uh, and that's resulted in huge changes really in the direction that research has taken in New Zealand dairy industry over the last few years. Um, traditionally we've been very production focused. Uh, now we're very much focused on the issues of the moment. They're around animal welfare, they're around uh, environmental management, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, they're about looming um, challenges in greenhouse gas emissions. So there's been a, a significant shift in the, in the portfolio of work we're doing, and it's driven by that strategy. Um, so what I uh, thought, and I can't see the big screen. I'm one of these people who likes looking at the big screen, so I've got to remember to focus on the small screen. Um, what I'd like to do is just very briefly um, give an overview of the changes that have happened in the in New Zealand industry in the last 25 years, particularly with relation to feed base, um, and really if you sum up that last 25 years, it's been a period of unregulated growth and, uh, and significant systems creep, and I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that in a moment. And generally when you're on a path of unregulated growth, as we have been in the New Zealand industry, eventually someone pops up and says, hey, can they do that? Um, should they be allowed to do that? And we're now seeing the consequences of that through regulation, which is starting to to bite pretty deeply into how dairy farming is, is being carried out and how it's going to be carried out in the future. I want to talk a little bit about some of those um, environmental issues and focus a little bit on how foragers can help meet some of the um, regulations that our farmers are being asked to address. So that's bringing through the feed base theme. Um, I would have liked to have talked about another consequence of this, which is a refocus on pasture in the industry. I don't think I'm going to have time to do that. Um, so uh, I'll get it out of the way now because I'm, I'm kind of a pasture, uh, I'm passionate about pastures, so it's unfortunate maybe that that bit's going to miss out. But um, we are seeing a significant refocus on pasture in the industry now, and it's fair to say uh, that um, over those 25 years, 1990 to 2014, there has been a considerable kind of taking of the eye off of the ball on homegrown forages in, in, in our New Zealand industry. Um, so we are now seeing a recognition again about the importance of homegrown forages. So bring it back to the theme of this conference and the common commonalities between our two industries. Homegrown forage, despite all the excitement we've had in New Zealand over the last few years about imported feeds and what we can do with imported feeds, has come back again, as it always does, um, as the bedrock of our of our industry. So, um, and the, but, there's, but there's still a number of challenges that are confronting us with um, pasture productivity, particularly in New Zealand. So I just wanted to um, touch on that. We won't be able to talk in much detail about what's going on in that space, but um, uh, it is now quite a significant part of our research portfolio again, which is good. And then maybe it's just some concluding comments to uh, to try and wrap this up. So um, changes in the, in the industry over the last uh, 25 years. Now, um, I'll skip through this reasonably quickly because I think many of you are quite, quite familiar with what's been going on across the Tasman. Um, essentially, I'm going to show four graphs, and um, three of those show an upward trajectory such as you're seeing in this first slide. This is um, total hectares in dairy production in the orange line and total cows in the black line. 
uh, both increasing, total hectares, uh, sorry, total cows more or less doubled over that period, uh, from just over 2 million to somewhere near 5 million, uh, and total hectares not quite doubled, um, but as a consequence of those two things, those two lines coming together, there's a bit of an increase in stocking rate across the industry as an average, but not a great increase. Um, up to around about, I think, national average, about 2.8 cows per hectare from about 2.4. Um, so it's really been more a, a story of expansion. Um, and that's what's driven a large part of the increase in milk solids production over that period of time. Now, you'll notice on that curve that it's flattened out since about 2014, as has the, the curve for a number of cows and, to a certain extent, a um, number of hectares that are used for dairy production as well. And 2014-15 was kind of a watershed year um, for our industry in the sense that these were the 14-15 uh, and 15-16 were very low payout years in our industry, as I think they were here as well, and that has actually had quite a significant effect on the, um, the refocus back on homegrown feed. And we'll see a little bit, some examples of how that's playing out at the moment. So that's, a, that's an increase in total feed demand uh, over that period, 1990 to 2014, of about 15 million tonnes of dry matter per hectare um, that we've had to find as an industry to support that growth. So uh, the question we can ask is where's that additional 15 million tonnes of dry matter come from? Uh, a couple of months ago there was this report released, you can see on the right hand side of your screen, um, which is an analysis of feed consumption, feed use in the dairy industry uh, since 1990, uh, 91 year, which is a, a, a real um, breakthrough kind of uh, analysis of the feed base of our industry, a really valuable tool to have. It breaks down feed use uh, by region. I'm just showing those graphs I've just shown you a moment ago, and probably some of the other information I'm gonna pull on is the national average story, but we can break it down by region we can see what changes have happened by what region uh, and over what periods of time. So broadly speaking, that 15 million of tonnes of extra dry matter, is two thirds of that has essentially come from expansion. And that's particularly expansion into the South Island, that's the Marlborough Canterbury region and the Southland regions that you can see on that map. About 600,000 hectares of land converted from other land uses into dairy over that period of time. But another third of it has come from intensification. And that intensification has essentially been through use of nitrogen fertiliser and the use of imported feed. So those, are, um, those have been our major feed-based trends over that period of time. And it looks a little bit like this. Uh, as a percentage of total feed used in the industry, we've gone from 1991 year from about four or five percent being total of the total being uh, imported feed up to around about 18%. Now, 18% may not sound like a big figure to most of you uh, dairying in New South Wales and most parts of Australia, but that's a huge change for the dairy industry in New Zealand. It's a big change. Um, and it's driven quite a lot of behaviour, probably. Um, and uh, I'd have to say, uh, most of the angst and debate and discussion and division in the industry over the last um, 10 or so years has been about that 18% at the bottom of the graph. And there's been no, little or no, well, this is the eye off the ball on homegrown foraging. There's been relatively little attention paid to the 80%, which is the green bars. Um, so it's been a bit out of whack. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the trend probably started to peak a little bit in 2000, and seven, eight. Um, again, unfortunately, I can't point to the screen, but you can see there's a little bit of a blip lift up in two, seven, and eight. Uh, it's increased for a period, and it started to level off. We can have a closer look at how that uh, that change in feed base has happened. I'll do that in a moment because the other thing to to draw out here is that two, seven, eight, two, seven, eight season uh, lift in the amount of homegrown, uh, sorry, imported feed used in the industry coincided with a really good milk payout year. Um, well over $7 milk payout. It was also, for us, a drought year, um, and nothing like the sort of drought, the, uh, the intensity and duration of drought that you're experiencing uh, in Australia, but uh, certainly for much of the North Island, uh, a very dry year. And uh, those two things combined um, certainly created a momentum for imported feed, and we started to see things take off uh, from that time on. 
And it looks a little bit like this. So this is total uh, feed use in tons of dry matter across the, uh, across the industry, and millions of tons of dry matter, if you like. So again, you can see that 07, 08 um, slight lift there. Well, it's perhaps a bit more than a slight lift, and then it's grown steeply since that time through to around about 13, 14, 14, 15 years, and we start to see it level off after that. So there's a lot of different feeds in there, uh, and a lot of diversity has been driven through the industry as a result. I want to just uh, highlight three in particular that have made up a large proportion of that change. The first one's PKE, started coming into our industry uh, in around about 708 in that, in that margin, uh, in, the, in that area, uh, and very quickly has gone to about one and a half million tonnes of uh, the, total, uh, the total feed inventory of the industry. Farmers are onto it very, very quickly. Low price, flexible, variable, um, uh, versatile in the way it can be used, uh, and it was a no-brainer uh, for most of our, or many of our farmers, um, to go the PKE way. May silage has always been a big part of the industry in New Zealand, and that's continued to grow over that period of time. And the other one that's really bolted is fodder beet. So that's gone from zero to uh, probably close to a million tonnes there of dry matter um, within the space of two or three years. Now, both May silage and fodder beet are homegrown feeds. They both complement aspects of our dairy systems really well. Maize works really well in the North Island. Summer active, warmer, grow a lot of feed. Fodder beet is an excellent winter feed for cows in the South Island, where um, pasture growth rates are low, and wintering on farm on grass is generally not a uh, is not practiced because there is area available for growing winter feeds like kale initially, but more recently fodder beet, and that's um, that's really taken off. Uh, and, and both, um, well, certainly fodder beet, you'd have to say, was very much a farmer-led initiative. Research did not necessarily point to the opportunity of fodder beet. Farmers got onto it, uh, and they saw the potential, and away it went. So the result of that has been that our, um, the, the, um, the delineation of system types in our industry that we tend to use, systems one to five, all defined on feed base, by the way, so that's another important kind of connection to the theme of this conference. The feed base is coming through here is very influential in understanding and describing the types of systems that our farmers operate. So a significant change in the structure of that from close to 40% in around about 2000 that were classified as system one, so they're basically operating as a pasture base only with no imported feed. Um, that's dropped down to about 10% by 210. Two uh, and what we see the big growth in is that green um, band through the middle there, which is our system three farms, using somewhere between 10 and 20% of feed. Now, what we need to note here is that's partly driven by expansion into the South Island, where cows are wintered off the milking platform on kale or fodder beet, and that winter feed is classified as imported feed in this definition. So by definition, expanding into the South Island and operating that winter grazing uh, practice has increased the number of, uh, of farms operating in system three category. But there's also been, as we've seen, that significant increase in uh, imported uh, other feeds, including concentrates. So the big question that, of course, um, people were asking and we were struggling to answer for quite a long time while that was going on, and remember, the, um, maybe I didn't point it out at the time, but this is really a strong production push. Uh, Fonterra were taking that feed and using that feed, uh, uh, sorry, that milk, and had markets for that milk, um, and uh, it, the, the, the mantra was production. And it's taken a while before the answers to the question of why we were doing this, did farmers make any money, any more money, uh, started to emerge. And the answer is, as an average, no. Um, this, is, this is an analysis, it's one analysis that's been done on the the dairy-based data set uh, that's available in New Zealand that's uh, looked at the differences between those different systems levels in terms of profit and return on assets. And on average, they haven't found any significant difference in profitability of farms across those three categorisations there, lumping a few of them together. I mean, some farmers did make more money out of intensification, others didn't. And it comes down to that um, magical ingredient of uh, management skill. And one of the factors that we have been able to uncover uh, from the dairy base and other analysis is that, in fact, when farmers have moved to more imported feed and they've looked at the feed cost, 
what they have not realised and what we've been slow as an industry to realise for quite a period of time is that that's, that's actually driven additional costs in the farm operation. We can call these sticky costs. For our farm systems that have gone from largely grass-based to importing feed, um, there's been a need to build infrastructure to do that. There's R&M that goes with that. There's a whole lot of other things that go along with it. So the, um, the picture is now quite clear that for every $1 spent on imported feed, there's probably about another 50 cents that's being added to operating costs. And that's fine if milk payout is about $8 a kilo, but it's not fine if it's about $5 a kilo of milk solids. So that's our background of our, um, of our journey in recent times. Uh, I guess uh, the point to, to, to reiterate to the audience here is that has been a period of, um, uh, well, a period when we've kind of lost the plot on homegrown feed and the importance of that. And that we're now, as I mentioned, we're now starting to turn, see that turn around. Partly it's a realisation of the profit thing. Partly it's also because uh, one of the consequences that comes from that rapid growth is that we're now uh, in, and I have to say in, our, many of our farmers are now in a, uh, a system of environmental regulation, which is putting a handbrake on a number of things, but certainly uh, that would include imported feed and total amounts of nitrogen being used for production. And I'll try and explain a little bit about that in a minute. Again, it comes back to feed base and how we're managing the feed base um, and how successfully we can manipulate the feed base to work our way through these environmental uh, constraints that are facing our industry. So um, the big one is freshwater quality, and uh, what we have every year is a report from Environment Aotearoa, which does a national analysis of freshwater quality in all New Zealand freshwaters, that's lakes, rivers, streams, not just in pastoral industry areas or agricultural areas, but nationally. However, one of the big issues that they have landed on for the last several years as they've been compiling these reports is what's shown here is issue number four, our waterways are polluted in farming areas. So there's no, no news in this, no new news. It's been around for a long time. Uh, it's been foreshadowed in government regulations in uh, around about 2010, uh, and it's now finding its way into regional uh, environmental regulation policies. And the, f the background trends um, look something like this. These are on, the, on your right-hand side, the, the trends in total amount of nitrate leached by pastoral sector. So you can see dairy proudly leading the way there. That's about another 70 or 80,000 tonnes of nitrate leached annually, uh, according to environmental monitoring estimates. Uh, that's accumulating in streams, rivers and lakes, um, and it's naturally attracted a huge amount of public and political influence. The clearest example where this is coming home into dairy farm practices in Canterbury, the region where I'm based, and this is the um, Environment Canterbury Regional Council, is the first of the New Zealand Regional Councils, the 13 of them. Uh, Canterbury is the first to actually implement enforce, enforceable regulation now. And it looks something like this. For some of the subcatchments in the Canterbury region, I pointed out two there. Uh, one is Selwyn Waihura uh, near Christchurch. One is the Heinz catchment a bit further south. These are both areas where there's been a lot of dairy conversion in the last um, 15 years. And if you're dairy farming, dairy farming in either of those subcatchments now, you are basically submitting an annual report to Environment Canterbury on your uh, your farm emissions, your farm nutrient emissions. And they are accumulating those reports, calculating a four-year running average, and uh, they will then consent your farming operation for a future period based on uh, your environment plan. In, this, in these two cases, your environmental plan to reduce your nitrate leaching from that four-year rolling average to somewhere between 30 and 36 uh, percent between now and 2022 to 2035. It's, it's, it's very complicated, the whole business. It's been done um, differently in many regions, but this is the reality for farmers. They're now in this, they're now in this uh, regulatory system. So this is regulation on output. It's regulating 
um, nitrogen losses from farms. It's not regulating nitrogen inputs to farms. But those are, those are huge uh, reductions in nitrate leaching. Uh, and these are enforceable. And in 2011, when this whole um, nutrient focus and, uh, and nutrient regulation policy started to, uh, started to emerge at government level, we had no idea whether farmers would be able to make those sort of reductions in nitrate leaching in those regions, on those shallow soils, very free draining soils with irrigation, uh, whether they'd be able to meet those sort of reduction targets and still have a profitable business. So when I go back to the, uh, the dairy strategy that I mentioned at the beginning, that's one of the real big commitments in that strategy is to develop farming systems that allow the industry to operate within the environmental regulations. Now, um, this has generated uh, a lot of hysteria in New Zealand um, over quite a period of time. Um, so May 2018, we have a minister. This is a minister of the Crown, not a minister of the cloth. This is actually uh, our environmental minister has come out and said New Zealand has too many cows. Um, Greenpeace, a day later, have come out with their latest poll results saying 52% um, of New Zealanders think we've got too many cows. So fewer cows is obviously the solution, guys. Let's, let's do that. Um, yeah, right. Well, uh, as usual, um, with a lot of these kinds of um, <clears throat> knee-jerk reactions to a problem, uh, it overlooks the point that cows aren't actually a source of nitrogen. If it's nitrogen we need to fix, then let's think about the nitrogen we're bringing into the farm system and where that's going. Cows aren't the source of nitrogen. They recycle it. They make it more vulnerable to nitrate leaching risk, um, but it's ultimately it's the amount of nitrogen we bring into the system and how we manage it that matters. And that's where a lot of our research has been focused in the last short while. The first thing we wanted to do was understand um, how efficient our farm systems were presently in nitrogen use and whether we needed to realign current farm practices to get a better system utilisation of nitrogen input. That's the first place to start. It's like doing up your shirt in the morning. If you if you get the wrong button, if you get the top button in the wrong hole, um, you can keep doing the other buttons up, but it won't look right. So basically, the, the, the first place to start is look at our system inputs and outputs. Uh, are those being inputs being used efficiently to generate outputs? If not, how can we realign our inputs or our outputs um, to get a better utilisation of, of, uh, of nutrients? Then we can build other mitigations on top of that, such as forage options, and we've done quite a bit of work in this, and I'll touch briefly on some of those in a moment. Another area that we're working on at the moment is um, looking for variation in cows for nitrogen partitioning patterns and nitrogen excretion patterns, and, and whether or not those can be successfully bred into a, uh, a breeding objective within the National Breeding Index in New Zealand. And basically what we're looking at here is breaking the relationship between production um, and environmental uh, outputs or environmental impacts. So system realignment, if we look at um, kind of, uh, well the nitrogen cycle um, has many dimensions to it, but those two at the top in green on the right hand side for you and, the le and uh, in blue for the left, on the, on the left hand side for you is uh, our inputs and outputs. And the balance between those two is what we call the nitrogen surplus. Now it's almost inevitable that as you bring in more nitrogen to produce more milk, you will lose more nitrogen. It is that type of element. It does not, it is not retained by the system. And we can expect some sort of general relationship like this, where as we strive for higher total production, we are going to reach a point where the extra nitrogen we're bringing in, whether in feed or fertiliser, is not going to increase production, or if it does, at a very low rate. And the surplus that is not going into product out the farm gate is going to be lost to the environment in one way or another. And the balance between those two, inputs minus outputs, is just a simple nitrogen surplus. Anyone can calculate this for their farm business. Uh, and we know that the nitrogen surplus is very closely related to nitrogen release to the environment. So while we can do lots of complicated work and for any farm calculate its estimated nitrate leaching, that's really dependent on the farm soil type, on its climate and so on. And it's often hard for farmers to relate to farm practices that can reduce their nitrate leaching when these environmental factors um, are so important. 
but the nitrogen surplus is under management control. It's under our control as to how much fertiliser we're bringing in, how much feed we're bringing in, and the efficiency with which we're converting that to outputs is also our, under our control. So we've kind of moved more now towards a nitrogen surplus approach to, um, to communicate and work with farmers about that system realignment. Uh, and when we look at, uh, this is a very complicated graph, I'm not going to try and uh, go through it, but those are our five, basically those coloured lines are our five system types, green is one, red at the top is five, so m basically increasing intensity, and that's showing the relationship between um, the production of milk on the vertical axis and the amount of farm nitrogen surplus that's being accumulated. And you can see that those curves are flattening off in exactly the way we'd expect. And you can see the nitrogen use efficiency, if you go to the bottom right of those curves, is sitting around about 33%, or maybe a bit above. By the time you get out to the right-hand end of those curves, I hope I'm... was it the other way around for you? Left-hand end of those curves, um, we've dropped well below 20, 25% nitrogen use efficiency. So we are, we are really um, not maximising the use of nitrogen for product in this case. And because we've been intensifying and moving from system one through to system five, basically over the last 15 or so years, we've just been on this trajectory. And really where we need to go now is back on this kind of trajectory. So, so there's another driver here for looking at feed base and inputs to feed production and milk production, and that is how we realign the systems to get a nitrogen surplus that's going to result in relatively low losses to the environment. So somewhere around the 150, 125 to 150 to 175 nitrogen surplus is kind of where we need to be, irrespective of what type of soil type you might be on. Uh, we've been pumping nitrogen fertiliser into the system uh, quite successfully. Actually, we started that before the, um, the boost in feed production or feed Im imported feed. So you can see nitrogen was on the increase from the early 2000s. The earlier graph I showed you had uh, imported feed lifting from about 2007 onwards. Um, we've lifted average nitrogen fertiliser rates on dairy farms from about 50, 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare in the early 1990s to around about 200 um, in the last, um, you know, by, by the mid-210s, 215, around about there. So there's plenty of scope to, well, we can certainly ask the question, is that nitrogen fertiliser being used efficiently? It's a very profitable uh, way to grow grass. Um, and without regulation, which is where we've been, uh, there's been nothing to stop the amounts of inputs that farmers have, have used. But now we've got to look at that. And we've got to ask the question, uh, which Dave Clark actually asked back in 1997, and if not earlier, so for over 20 years ago, we've known that there is a, a very strong um, uh, flattening response to nitrogen fertiliser inputs uh, in terms of milk production. And now we've got to come back and revisit this and look at where our, where our optimum sits. The first clear example of this at scale was done by the Le at the Lincoln University Dairy Farm. Many of you here will be familiar with LUDF, as it's known, Lincoln University Dairy Farm, demonstration farm that in around about 2013-14 um, took upon it, uh, took upon the, themselves the objective of demonstrating farming practices that are going to meet the new environmental limits that are coming out. So they could do this because they, um, they have the backing of the university and other, other supporters. So they can take a lot of risk on behalf of farmers that farmers themselves wouldn't be able to take. So um, we, had, we had been completing, working on a, on a program of research called Pastoral 21 um, in, from around about 2011 onwards and, uh, and exploring some of these issues of nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, and in about 2014-15, LUDF picked up the same approach. Previously, they'd been on the journey, as you can see here. So um, the blue line, the blue bars and the red bars are the nitrogen surplus and nitrogen fertiliser inputs for that farm over that period of time. And you can see in 12-13, uh, they topped out at over 350 kilos of nitrogen fertiliser going into the farm system. The black line that traces is their estimated nitrate leaching using the overseer regulatory tool. You can see that that was, that was um, heading skyward. The dashed line is their four-year rolling average nitrate leaching from 2009 to 2013. That's their regulated um, level of nitrate leaching that's now being monitored by Environment Canterbury. This farm is in the Selwyn Waihora catchment and their um, nitrogen leaching will need to drop by 30% 
uh, in order for that farm to, be, to continue to be consented as a dairy farming land use. So in around 14, 15, they backed out quite a lot of fertiliser, backed it out to about 160 kilos. Uh, the nitrogen surplus dropped, the estimated nitrogen leaching dropped, and it came down to around about that 30% below the four-year rolling average benchmark. A very powerful demonstration that at scale, this is a 630 cow herd when it started, um, at scale, there are options for meeting those targets. And this, we did not know this in 2011 when we started out on this work, whether that would be achievable or not. Now it sounds pretty neat and simple, it's not. It's a major system change and so there was discussion before lunch about extension and how we do extension. How do we do extension to get practice changes? Qu quite challenging in a case like this where uh, there is major system realignment needed and a long story short, but one of, the, one of the areas we've concentrated on in the last few years in Dairy NZ is doing this with farmers. That's what we might call a co-development approach. It's getting farmers involved very early on in the research itself um, and engaging uh, on their own properties in some of the practice change that we believe is necessary to, to reach our targets. And you may be asking questions about what was the productivity uh, and the profit of that system over that period of time, well actually it didn't, it didn't, it didn't get knocked badly off course. Uh, on blue bars are pasture eaten, orange line is milk production. Profit was still within the top 5%, if not the top 2% of dairy farms in Canterbury, LUDF benchmarked themselves against other farms, profit was still strong. And this is all about efficiencies, using nitrogen when it's needed, as it's needed, in the amounts that are needed. So just the last few minutes, talk about some of the forage options that we've recently explored, uh, started exploring. There's various ways of manipulating what's going on in the system. Um, we can look at urinary nitrogen excretion because that does increase the risk of nitrate leaching and ask how we might reduce that. We can look at uh, plants taking up more nitrogen. If plants take up more nitrogen, then it's less likely to be leached. And we can look at uh, reducing the amount of nitrogen cows are eating. One way to do that is through reducing the nitrogen content of the forages that they're eating. So we've had a look at all three of those various options um, and very briefly in the reduce category we are quite excited about the plant plantain which is a, a pasture herb, a grazable herb which is doing some really interesting things in the animal and potentially in the soil. Italian ryegrass, a winter active grass, uh, very uh, powerful for nitrogen uptake during the winter period which is a leaching period leaching risk period and also catch crops following those winter kale or fodder beet crops um, that cows are grazing at high density, depositing a lot of urinary nitrogen into the system. And finally the um, plant content one, well fodder beet's a good example of a plant with very low crude protein concentrations and it was therefore potential for reducing nitrogen excretion. So plantain very quickly um, what we see is that it does decrease urinary nitrogen concentration, it does that as a diuretic. It's got some very interesting bioactive compounds in it. Um, we very consistently see from a number of studies, which this graph summarises, that as plantain content in the diet increases, the urinary nitrogen concentration goes down. The importance of that is that the urine patch then doesn't contain as much nitrogen as might have previously, and there's a better chance for plants to be able to take that nitrogen up instead of the surplus being leached through the soil profile. Um, we need to know more about how much plantain we need in the diet and in the farm system. Um, this, this, gra this table very quickly, the take home message out of this one is that it's not until we get above 30% plantain in the diet that we start to see these things shift. So that's, that's quite a change. Changing the feed base to get a, a plantain intake of about 30% of total feed e eaten is no small matter. So this is a work in progress. Um, the reduction in nitrogen in urine is associated with more nitrogen being partitioned to milk and more to faeces, so that's good from a production point of view and a nitrogen risk, risk point of view. Um, and we know that's related to certain aspects or nutritive value characteristics of the plant along with its uh, bioactive compounds. We've got more work to do on this and um, that includes proving that it will have a benefit for nitrogen leaching at scale. It's okay doing small plot stuff but we've got to know whether it's going to work at, at scale for farmers to be convinced got to know more about its modes of action, we've got to know whether it's having any negative effects on milk composition, market access, maybe even some positive effects. 
and driving adoption. Um, there are two other quick options. One is catch, catch crops, which are showing some considerable potential for taking up nitrogen after winter grazing. You can see the reductions that have been measured in one study here. Very soil type specific. Um, free draining soils are okay. You can get on with a crop soon after cows go off in um, around about July, August. Other soil types, uh, very, very uh, limited opportunity to do so. So that's very specific to soil type. Fodder beet, we have again seen some significant reductions in nitrogen intake in particular. Those have transferred into urinary nitrogen load. There are some issues around um, metabolics and some of the other uh, nutrient intake uh, characteristics of fodder beet, particularly phosphorus and calcium that have to be managed. So it's got its own set of challenges, but we have also seen in some work um, on free draining soils in Canterbury, quite a significant reduction in nitrate leaching. You'll see that bottom row there, suction cups, that's a method of measuring nitrogen directly under the soil, uh, showing quite a significantly lower value under fodder beet than kale. So I'm um, not going to talk about refocus on pasture and just a few quick concluding comments, Mr Chairman, if we've got a, enough time. So where we've been on a fair old journey of high production and high inputs, that's slowly abating. It's going to take a while to turn this around. Um, but there are a number of factors that are driving that. We've touched on some. Um, capital gains are certainly drying up in the industry. Farms aren't moving as rapidly as they would in terms of sales and prices are down. Cash flow uh, is, is critical um, now that uh, the servicing of debt, um, which is very significant in our industry, which has always been there, but it's even more critical now that capital gains are not um, rising as much as they have in the past. We've got um, these heavy environmental pressures that the industry are facing. Um, water quality, we're in it now. Uh, methane emissions I haven't touched on, but um, the government's recently announced a net zero carbon bill, which is going to require 10% reduction in methane emissions across sheep and beef and dairy industries by 2030. And very, very significant cuts uh, beyond that if that bill gets through. So there's naturally a fair bit of angst about how we're going to do that. Um, everything we've learned to date suggests the nutrient issues we can deal with. We've got quite a few tools up, up our, um, in, in the toolbox. System realignment, we've got plants, we've got animal solutions. Um, so um, it, may not, uh, it may not sound convincing to farmers at this stage when we tell them we've got confidence we can meet those challenges. Um, but. Without, with the R&D foundation behind this has been absolutely critical to get us to a position within probably about seven or eight years where we can point to the evidence to give farmers confidence that we can deal with this one. And the refocus on pasture, which we didn't get time to tick, um, talk about, but uh, some of those of, those of us who have been old, around, who are old enough to have been around for a while will say, yeah, right, um, we've heard this before. Uh, and every time there seems to be this creep um, back to imported feed and higher production. Uh, it just, um, farmers just love feeding cows and producing milk. Um, so we'll see whether that's going to stick and we've got to do some work driving increased rates of genetic gain in forages uh, and like you but nowhere near as severely we've got some climate change signals that we're picking up in um, particularly in northern New Zealand, which are going to severely test the ryegrass clover pasture base that we're fortunate enough to have. So um, I'll leave it there and thank you for your attention. Excellent. Tintin Cow for the time to come up all the way <laughs> up here. So, um, Restructuring this session a little bit, I'm always mindful of there's, there might be burning questions after every presentation and that we might not get time when we get to the panel. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually open it up for some questions now. We've got five minutes for questions right now. If you have any burning questions for David. Don't. One at the back, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK, good. I was just in New Zealand two weeks ago in the, in the Rotorua area. And I find the focus, the negativity around supplementation is it's probably a tool in controlling milk, urea and nitrogen. And PKE is probably not one of those tools given the protein level of the feed. 
So I think a refocus on not only pasture based and obviously the plantain research, but the quality of the energy concentrates that get used in capturing nitrogen. What's yep. your point, thoughts yep. on that? Yep, I skipped over it. There was a summary table that um, I, was, I was going to just step through. It was about five or six kind of recommended um, mitigations that can be used, and one of them was you know, backing out higher nitrogen feeds for lower nitrogen feeds if you're still using a supplement. And look, farmers will continue to use supplement. I mean, it's got a role, absolutely, in, in managing uh, feed shortages. Where, we've kind, of, where we've, we've kind of gone off the rails a bit is we just kept using more supplement as a strategy rather than a tactic. So farmers will continue to use supplements, and definitely it is viable to, um, where possible, back out some of the higher nitrogen supplements with, with lower nitrogen supplements. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely an option. Other questions? Oh, there must be a few. I've got about three or four. Don't make me take it up. I was trying to have a look at what you've got. <laughs> I've got a page of questions here. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, Yanni. Is there a mic? Thanks, Dave. Excellent presentation. Um, I was wondering, when I was there involved with Pastoral 21 from the outside, there were a lot of people moving into, I mean, one of the obvious consequences of, uh, redu or, or for reducing nitrogen in pasture, mm. the, the um, opinion was to, okay, let's take the cows out of the paddock. And there were a lot of changes, changes uh, occurring in following that sort of a line. Well, how, yeah. how, how has that kind of a yep. evolved and, and where is it going? <clears throat> yep, um, so it's still, it's still a, um, a, an issue that uh, there's not a lot of research going on into it, but um, it's definitely something that many, far many farmers have invested in some capital in infrastructure to do a couple of things. One is to be able to stand animals off, um, particularly in autumn, uh, which seems to be the period when urinary nitrogen is going back onto pasture, it's at its highest risk of then leaching in the winter rainfall period and the drainage period. So um, standoff pads to basically get animals off pasture at that time for say 12 hours a day, um, you're cutting half the amount of nitrogen going back onto the pasture during that sensitive period. Um, yep, it's going to work. Quantitatively, they've then got the issue of what are you going to do with the, um, you know, the feed pad materials you're using, unless you're going to go to the next step, which is you build something quite substantial where you can collect nutrient, effluent, etc., and respread. Now, I should have prefaced and said that a lot of this work is done on uh, fully grazed systems, really, and that's, re you know, that's our fundamental uh, farm system. And <coughs> not many farms, or relatively few farms, have geared up with the infrastructure to be able to collect effluent. Um, you know, it is an option, um, but it's a capital, more capital intensive one. And I guess from a research point of view, what we've tried to do is keep a cows and grass solution, if we can, with minimal infrastructure investment. And my point, just briefly at the end, about debt levels kind of underscores that. I mean, farmers are carrying a lot of debt just through land pur purchase and, and conversion and so on. Um, adding another 1,000 to 2,000 dollars per cow of, of um, borrowing to build facilities is um, ain't going to work for a lot of people. One more question. One more question. One, Actually, two one. more. I'll add two. Yep, uh, one here uh, and then one here and then that'll be. Uh, with the increase in plantain in the pasture, say to 30 to 45 percent, has there been a positive uh, increase in cow fertility with that? Oh, cow fertility. Um, <clears throat> Not that we've observed, but we haven't actually, uh, we haven't gone looking for it um, at this stage. Um, in fact, we're, we're only at the stage of, early stage of, of testing the effects of plantain inclusion on system productivity for a start, feed grown, uh, milk production. Um, and if there are any associated effects on uh, animal welfare or well-being that might be associated with it. We haven't looked at the reproduction one. Um, and I'm not sure what you're thinking might uh, might be the components of plantain or the features of plantain that would have an effect on fertility. No, it was just the cow nitrogen levels. Um, right, right. With lower cow nitrogen, there might right. be high fertility. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the animal is partitioning more out into into um, into milk and um, and feces. Uh, generally speaking, plantain is not lower in nitrogen content in the herbage than ryegrass. It's quite similar, um, and the effects uh, are more to do with the solubility of the protein and also the carbohydrate to nitrogen ratio. Um, yeah, carbohydrate to nitrogen ratios. So they can have similar nitrogen intake. Um, and there, uh, and there are some partitioning differences that flow from that, but the uh, the total nitrogen eaten often is quite the same. Just very quick, quick one. Yep. Yes, thanks, David Porchin from uh, Melbourne Uni. Quick question about uh, those mitigating strategies you talked about, such as plantain. Do you have a comment on how would they potentially impact on methane emission? Because that's another side of the pollution, obviously. Yeah, questions about things like plantain and methane emissions. Um, uh, we don't have any reason to believe that feeding plantain will reduce methane emissions. Um, pretty similar in uh, fibre concentrations, digestive, um, metabolizable energy and so on. It'd be nice to think that it, uh, that it might, but um, we're asking it to do one thing and asking it to do two things is probably too much. Um, it will have an effect on nitrous oxide losses. Um, that's another greenhouse gas that's kind of in our system is bundled in with carbon dioxide. Uh, that's still useful. Um, but methane emissions, not likely. Thank you so much, uh, David. We'll let you off now. Um, so please join me in thanking David for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, David.